sacrifice of praise. Praise Him this morning into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you the sacrifices.
as I was asking the Lord, what is it he wants me to say, if anything? And this is the verse, oh, I gotta get my Bible, excuse me. Verses that came to my mind which is in Romans chapter 8. And this is something that God continues to talk to me about. I hear over and over again, and a lot of stuff, or some of the stuff I might say, you've heard me say before. But in Romans chapter 8, I think it's verse 12. <clears throat> well, actually, I want to start with verse 9, chapter 8, verse 9, which says, You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. And if the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. Now sometimes my body don't seem dead. That sin nature seems alive. But God's word is telling me it's dead. And yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. And this is the one after that came to my thoughts first, which says, therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death by the misdeeds of the body. Now notice it says, you put to death the deeds of the body, but it says by the spirit. And see, that's something I've always still struggle with. The things I know I shouldn't that I do, which because sin is within me, but it says by the spirit. And that's how, it's by the spirit only that we can. But anyway, as I read on, it says, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. If you did not receive the Spirit that maketh you a slave again to fear, but you received the Spirit of sonship or daughtership, and by him we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy, God, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Heirs to what, right? I mean, we know some things, we've read things, but we really have, I don't think, and we really have an idea what, it, what we are inheriting. I mean, with my finite mind, I can imagine this and that and read certain things, but it's much bigger than we can comprehend, I believe. <clears throat> now, if we are children, then we are heirs heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ, if indeed 
we share in his sufferings. Mm, don't like that word, sufferings. But look at, look at it this way. We're all going to have sufferings. He tells us, we're promised these things are going to happen. But we don't like that part of it. But in order that we may also share in his glory. So the suffering is temporary. The glory is forever. So I still don't want to go through it, okay, to tell you the truth. But thank God, he ain't going to give me what I, I want him to give me what he wants. You choose it for me, Lord, because I don't want to insist on my way. Because I did that already and I really messed it up. But that's the, the couple of scriptures that came to me that... Um, there, but I want to just add a couple of more things that other scriptures to that, which, uh, if you'll give me a second. Yes, okay. Let's just go to Second, second Timothy. Now, I've said this before, but I just want to put it together. Um, Drawing a blank. Here it is. Okay. And so it is uh, second, second Timothy 19, I believe, or it might go before that. Well, let me go a little ahead of that in, in verse 14, which says, now this is my NIV, so yours is going to probably be a little different, but it says, keep reminding them of these things, warn them before God against, uh, well, actually, let me skip that. Let's go to uh, 17. Their teachings will, no, not even there, sorry. <laughs> Let's just stay with 19. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm. Sealed with this inscription, the Lord knows those that are his. And everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. There it is again. Wickedness, different word, but to me it means basically my sin nature. But here is the part that stuck out to me, I would hear it when I listened to my scriptures and I said, what does that mean? And then I really, anyway, it says in verse 20, in a large house, there are many articles, not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes and some for ignoble. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, so the latter is the ignoble, right? He will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful in the master, prepared to do any good work. So to me, it seems that you can be a Christian, be saved, going to heaven, but not be cleansed of all these different things. And maybe I'm wrong, but I believe that's why God, if you allow God by the spirit to work on your flesh, to deal with your sins, to clean you, clean you up, <clears throat> of course, the blood. And we're a, we are a process, or a, not a process, we are in uh we're under construction. In other words, we're not just, okay, now I'm a perfect guy and I don't, have, I don't have any problems. But you're fit for the master's work, his purposes. He wants to use your lives. He didn't just save you so you can go to heaven and uh, be free, but his purpose to leave you here is to be a blessing for others. He has a purpose for our vessels and he chooses to use imperfect human beings to do it. And he chooses those that you will go, what? 
why would God use that person for whatever? But that he may receive the glory. Because some people, they got it all together. They're good orators. They just have it, you know, they just, they got it together. But God also says that he will use the foolish to confound the wise. Because it's about his glory, not ours. Doesn't matter what people think of me, though it bothers me. I get embarrassed. I get stressed out because it does bother me but if I'm really sold out it shouldn't bother me if I'm like I don't care what people think well it's been in degrees for me definitely and I can remember being in Bible college <clears throat> and they wanted me to speak and oh man I, I couldn't talk to people and, and speak out I froze in college trying to take a public speaking class and just stood there but anyway, my point, he works on us, is my point, to, to free us. So freedom is in degrees also, right? I mean, some things God has set me free of like that it was instant. I didn't have to do nothing. I didn't have to battle it. And other things he left there to linger. But my, my, my point in that, or bringing that in, is that they go together from, from rock to me, Romans. And um, that he's life to each one of our spirits. They were dead first. Now they're alive. And it says in the scripture, and don't ask me where, that we are seated together with him in heavenly places. My spirit is there, but my soul, I don't have a great understanding of any of that. But I do want to encourage because we all go through our seasons of difficulty our seasons of times where we don't sense anything we don't feel anything we're not inspired we just kind of want to disappear for a while but God says to press on and I wanted to read something which I read this morning and maybe I should put something else first, but I think I'll just start with this because it comes to mind. And it's actually Spurgeon again, but it was this morning and I thought it was fitting, which is 1 Peter 1, 7, which says the trial of your faith. It says faith untried may be true faith, but it's sure to be little faith. It is likely to remain dwar uh, <coughs> dwarfish so long as it's without trials. Faith never as it is without trial, uh, excuse me, so long as it is without trials. Faith never prospers so well as when all things are against her. Temptists are her trainers. Lightnings are her illuminators. When a calm rains on the sea, spread the sails as you will, the ship moves not to the harbor. For on a slumbering ocean, the Neil sleeps too. Let the winds rush, howling forth. Let the waters lift up themselves. And then though the vessel may rock, and her deck may be washed with waves, and her mask may creak under the pressure of the full and swelling sail, it is then that she makes headway toward her desired haven. No flower wears so lovely a blue as those which grow at the foot of a frozen glacier. No stars gleam so brightly as those which glisten 
in the polar sky. No water tastes so sweet as that which springs amid the desert sand. And no faith is so precious as that which lives and triumphs in adversity. Tried faith brings experience. You could not have believed your own weaknesses had you not been compelled to pass through the rivers. And you would never have known God's strength had you not been supported amidst the water floods. Faith increases in solidarity, solidity, sorry, assurance and intensity. And more, the more it is exercised with tribulation, faith is precious and its trials are precious too. Now, I know you all know this, you've heard it a million times, but I think we always need to be encouraged. We come together, what are we to do? Encourage one another. I don't know what you're going through, I don't know what you're going through, I might know some things, but when we're together, one may be up and one may be down. One may bring a word that speaks to your heart. And you might have heard it a million times, but this time it just went, oh, just what I needed to hear. Just what was going to carry me through this trial I'm going through. So, <clears throat> so the trials come and I don't like them and you don't like them. The trial, like it says, without the trials, your faith is unproven. You don't know the depth of how much God's got you and what he's doing and that you can be weak, but that's when you see that your God is strong for you. But I still don't like to do any of it. I still don't want it to happen. But yes, says a greater good, right? So yes, they will come. And, you know, what do we think? One day I'm going to get to the place where I never have a trial until God takes me home. I don't think so. Until the gates, they say, I forget how it goes. But I wanted to read a couple of scriptures here. And then I'll let you go. Okay. Go to Revelations here for a minute. Revelation 7, verses 9 through 17. Now, part of this speaks of, and I go, well, it's talking about the great tribulation, is it not? Or are you talking about tribulation? Think what you will, but I think this applies to those that are going through tribulation and also those that will be in the great tribulation. But it says, after these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, people, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worship God saying, amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever, amen. And then the one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And he said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. 
They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst, got the wrong page, in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. The God and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes through the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, we struggle. Yes, we have our ups and downs. Yes, we go through seasons of valleys and seasons on the mountaintop. But no, we always remember that in the valley is where you grow. Through the tribulations, that's where you grow. So what you do is you just pick yourself up each time you might fall and you say, okay, I'm going to get up and I'm going to keep going. And I'm not going to care what I hear in my ear and what kind of failure I am and give up because what's the use? You can't do it. Well, no, I can't do it, but by God can do it through me as I look to him. And I can't, I can't depend upon my cleanliness because I screw up all the time. So I got a place where I can go and get cleansed. I have the blood of the lamb, but not because I'm good, not because I'm great, but because my God is good. My God is great. <clears throat> and in Hebrews 9, 11, 9, verses 11 through 14. Give you a second. But Christ came as high priest of all the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy once for all, having obtained eternal redemption for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifers and sprinkle, sprinkling the unclean sanctified for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Hallelujah for the blood. In Hebrews 9, 28, it says, so Christ, which offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly, eagerly wait for him. You gotta eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time, apart from sin for salvation. And in Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, it says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance, assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, there it is. No man's an island. You can't do it on your own. We need one another. Wherever God places you, you need to be planted. God created the church bodies. Now, of course, circumstances may bring a person in a time in their life that they have to be. But if all you are able, God wants you to be planted where you may spring forth and grow and bear fruit and uh, for a second, uh, did I stop? But exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. And I'm 
can I, I got a few more. <laughs> I know this a lot. Hebrews 10, so you don't have to turn the page. Uh, verse 35 to 39, therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise, which is, for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by what? Faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but those who believe to the saving of the soul. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Last one from the Song of Solomon, which says, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 9. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He is looking through the windows, gazing through the lattice. We are blessed to be a blessing. That's not scripture. But we are blessed to be a blessing to others. It's not all for you. Don't get the idea you're just going to soak it all up and enjoy it. And that's it. He has a purpose in this time. So may God give us all strength, which he does. He gives us everything we need. But I'm going to pray before we dismiss. And Lord, I just bring before you this people, this small group that is here and those that either didn't make it or in other countries or whatever. But Lord, I ask, oh God, that your will, your perfect will would be done in their lives. And that which they were born to be, they shall be. That they would not just have your permissive will, but your perfect will in their lives. And Lord, well, we might look at our lives if we're older and say that, well, it's too late. What could have been is not. Well, did not God know? Did you not know, Lord, what we would do and what we would not do? Did you not know the different things that would happen in our lives? So Lord, nothing was a surprise to you. But while you have given us breath and we dwell on this side of eternity, Lord, may our lives be sold out for you, for your purpose, why we were born, and whether we be, consider ourselves little or not, your perfect will is what we want. We want you to greet us on the other side saying, well, come on in, come on in. You were faithful in what I gave you to do. You weren't called to be an evangelist. You weren't called to be a missionary, but you were faithful to do what I called you to do, whether it be in the workplace. You are called to be a blessing to those that surround you. You may be called, we may be called to do this or that, but we want to be led by him, not our own deal. We want you to do it all, Lord. We want to be, have a heart that is quick to obey and not fight you on it, but quick to obey. So work in our hearts, so oh God, that we will be quick to obey. Because, Lord, yes, we love you and we want to love you more. Yes, we know you are real and that you've done wonderful things in us, but we want you to continue. We want you to have all of us possess all of us, not just a part. May your perfect will be done in each one. Lord, get them where you want them. Speak to their hearts. Anoint them for that which you have called them to do, oh God that they may be truly a blessing to those that you have caused them to be around or 
to be in one's life, oh God. Thank you, Lord. You know what each one of us needs. You know. You know what each one has. The gifts you have given each one. Lord, use them for your glory. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.